Greetings, everyone, and welcome. And thank you for joining Nurse Narratives in the Arts panel discussion today. Uh, this event is part of Nursing These Wounds, a multi-year project exploring the experiences of Filipino nurses in the diaspora. My name is Alulia Panis, Director of Cool Arts and the lead artist of Nursing These Wounds project with composer Joshua Iqban and media artist Wilfred Galila. Uh, where are we? Closed captioning is available. Instructions to turn these on will be posted in the chat. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat function um, to express your appreciation or ask any questions you might have for our panelists. This event is presented by Cool Arts in partnership with Filipino American Development Foundation and support from Yerba Buena Arts and Events and the Bolosan Center for Filipino Studies at UC Berkeley. UC Davis, excuse me. Um, the Bolosan video, please.
and now the land acknowledgement to recognize the territory that we are gathered on. This panel is inspired by the many Filipino nurses whose experiences with westernized medical education and migrations lay the groundwork for the global export of Filipino labor. This phenomenon continues uh, to shape the healthcare industry in the United States and of course, the world. Um, uh, we see this with the, the current pa pandemic and it has thrown wide open for the world to see the dangers, the sacrifices, the systemic inequities of the American healthcare industry. Um, it's a honor and a deep salama to tonight's moderator, my good friend, uh, Dr. Joyce Liu, and our panelists, Dr. Jason Magabo Perez and visual artist extraordinaire, Jennifer Wofford. To provide a framework for tonight's panel, um, we'll, we'll be viewing a short video by AJ Plus entitled, Why Are There So Many Filipinos in the US? Okay, so you might be saying, um, Sana, the U.S. has a lot of Filipino nurses? Yep. Here's what's up. Back in 2015, foreign-born Filipinos made up the fourth largest group of immigrants in the country. And the majority of Filipinos are in California, where they make up 20% of the nursing force, which is impressive when you consider that they only make up about 4% of the state's population. Now, it's easy to think of the Philippines as all the way over there and the United States right over here. But Dr. Catherine Sneeza Choi, who wrote the book Empire of Care, says that imagining Filipinos as simply foreigners actually erases a history between the countries. Filipinos and specifically certain groups of Filipino immigrant workers, like immigrant nurses, are not foreigners in the way we tend to think about foreigners. That they actually have historical interaction with Americans. And that interaction begins like so many other immigrant interactions with colonization. The Spanish colonized and ruled the archipelago we now call the Republic of the Philippines for a few centuries. In 1898, the Americans and the Spanish went to war, and it ended with the signing of the Treaty of Paris. As a result, the Americans got a lot of territories from the Spanish, one of which was the Philippines. But the people of the islands didn't welcome the Americans. They wanted their independence, not more colonizers. That resistance led to the three-year-long Philippines-American War from 1899 to 1902, and it was fought between U.S. forces and Filipino nationalists. And it was a brutal war for Filipinos. It killed 20,000 combatants and 200,000 civilians as a result of the violence, diseases like cholera and malaria, and even famine. When the war ended, the Philippines came under the colonial control of the United States. And that's when the story of the Filipino nurses begins. Like in its other colonies, the United States began the Americanization of the islands after setting up a government in the Philippines. You also had American colonial officials going to the Philippines and exposing Filipinos to American culture, to the English language, to Americanized education. And this kind of training influenced so many different groups of Filipinos to dream about the U.S. 
and to desire to migrate there. American health workers in the Philippines needed locals to deal with the health issues of Filipinos because malaria and cholera had killed so many during the war. But they didn't find any nurses trained the way the Americans had been trained. And so they began recruiting Filipino women to work as what were called volunteer auxiliary and contract nurses. Around the same time in 1903, President William Taft passed a law that allowed and funded certain Filipino students to study in American colleges. And this led to the first wave of Filipino nurses coming to the United States, and it also led to a lot of the nurses staying. They even established their presence with organizations like the Philippine Nurses Association of New York, and the waves of Filipino nurse migration continued throughout the 20th century, especially as the United States opened up its borders a bit more. During World War II, more Filipino nurses were trained to serve in the U.S. military. And during the same time, the Philippines came under Japanese occupation. After the war ended, the United States granted the territory independence in 1946. And two years later, the State Department introduced the Exchange Visitor Program, a little something created to push back against Soviet influence. You know, bring more people into the United States and show them what the capitalist good life is actually all about. Because of the decades-long colonial relationship and education in English language, the Philippines became a model country for the program, and the nurses led the way. The program was so successful that it actually encouraged more Filipinos to go into nursing. The number of nurses in the Philippines jumped over 700%, from 7,000 in 1948 to over 57,000 in 1953. The program also encouraged the building of more nursing schools in the Philippines. Back in 1940, there were only 10, and today, 429. That program, in addition to the 1965 Immigration Act, opened up the borders even more for educated Filipinos. And so by 1973, we end up seeing over 12,000 Filipino nurses immigrate to the United States. But I gotta mention this, it wasn't just because of American immigration policies that so many Filipinos were migrating to the U.S. In the 1970s, with President Ferdinand Marcos, who ruled under martial law, a policy of labor export was introduced. The whole idea behind the export of labor was that Filipinos would travel abroad on work contracts, make money, send it back home, and thus help a struggling economy. The government even created an agency that directly provided migrant labor to foreign governments and companies. That policy pretty much made the Philippines one of the top exporters of labor. I mean, check this, about 10% of all Filipinos are foreign workers. That's around 10 million people in around 170 different countries. And did the policy of exporting labor actually work for the economy? Well, for decades, the Philippines has been one of the top five recipients of money transfers from migrant labor. Shout out to Western Union, not sponsored. Take, for instance, how in 2015, over 3 million Filipinos left the country to work abroad. They sent back $28.5 billion, which made up about a tenth of the Philippines' total GDP. So exported labor is a big deal for the Philippines, and it really does get to the heart of the Filipino immigrant experience, whether in a country like Saudi Arabia or in the United States. And it's equally important to note that despite the so-called success of the export of Filipino labor, it's come with a lot of sacrifice, struggle, and vulnerability. Ability. Take, for example, Filipino nurses here in the United States who are professionals but still face discrimination. The vulnerability of being immigrant nurses can also be connected to being exploited by being assigned sometimes the most undesirable kinds of work on the nursing floor or being assigned on the most undesirable shifts. Unfortunately, they are not the kinds of challenges we often think about in the United States that these women would have because they are professional immigrant workers. But even though exported or imported labor is central to Filipino migration, especially to the United States, that's not the only part of the Filipino immigrant experience. In the United States, Filipinos, both citizens and immigrants, have used their experiences to fight for workers' rights. In fact, one of the biggest labor movements in the United States was sparked by Filipino laborers. In 1965, Filipino grape farm workers in Delano, California went on strike against poor working conditions and low wages. Farm workers across the country joined in on the strike, which eventually led to an international boycott of grapes. The five-year strike ended with a major win for the farm workers. They got union contracts that protected them. So Filipinos, immigrants, and citizens have been and remain a central part of the U.S.'s social fabric. They've not only provided labor in industries that needed it the most, but at times have also protected it. Wow. Okay. So um, 
I really want to introduce um, our moderator for this evening. Um, and I'm so happy that we're, I've known her for how many decades now. Uh, and finally, we are working together on this project. Um, so I want to introduce uh, Joyce Liu, um, PhD. She is a performing artist and professor of theater at Pomona College. She teaches contemporary drama and performance and specializes in applied theater, movement, Asian and Asian American performance. My good friend, Joyce, take it over. Okay, here I come. Thank you, Alicia. I'm so honored to be here with you and all these amazing artists and a welcome to all the audience who came here today. Um, so I just wanted to provide a little framing before we introduce the other artists. We had a subtitle for this panel, which was a panel of interdisciplinary artists who are engaged in the poetics and politics of care and migration. So that's like a big, big chunk of language there. So I just wanted to break down this thing of uh, interdisciplinary and really highlight the fact that all of these artists naturally express themselves through multiple mediums. And I also wanna mark that Jason has actually um, expressed a critique before of this term interdisciplinary because it's kind of like English has to um, make up a term for blending disciplines because in the Western culture, maybe those these dis different art disciplines have been separated. And I think for these artists, what's really cool and what I really admire about them all is they very naturally flow in and out of all disciplines. And, you know, I don't know if it's a cultural thing or an immigrant thing that we tend to use everything that's available to us um, and combine things in new ways. So I feel like, you know, all of these artists are really exciting in terms of things that they've innovated in terms of ways to express through the arts political concerns. And then I also want to break down this term of poetics. I recently heard a a talk where Cornell West was uh, talking about Paul Robeson, the African-American uh, artist, actor, singer, activist. Um, and so Cornell West was saying that, you know, Paul Robeson and I would say the artists today were, were all poets. Um, and, a, and he said, a poet means those of us who use imagination and empathy to enter an alternate world. So think about that poetry as poets, as people who use imagination and empathy to enter an alternate world. And I also think that piece alternate is really interesting because alternate to what? Like, why do we need to make these alternate worlds or what's the purpose of entering into an alternate world? Um, and then he also said, and when we enter that alternate world, we use the imagination and empathy, then we become we conscious rather than simply I conscious so we're, we're conscious of the community that we're in um, which is something that is really also applies to all of the artists today so um, without further ado I'm going to start to introduce our first featured artist who is Jason Magabo Perez he is a writer performer teacher and scholar he's the author of the books of poetry phenomenology of superhero and this is for the most list, which you should definitely check out those volumes. He is a recipient of the um, National Endowment for the Arts Challenge America grant, which is uh, fitting. He's a recent artist in residence at the Center for Art and Thought. And he has been a featured performer at notable venues such as National Asian American Theater Festival, International Conference of the Philippines, La Jolla Playhouse, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions down here in LA, I'm in LA. And currently he is working as an assistant professor of ethnic studies at Cal State University at San Marcos. And he is the inaugural community arts fellow at Bulosung Center. Some of you may know that Jason has a very personal connection to nursing. He is one of the three sons, the youngest son of Leonora Perez who was a nurse who along with another nurse, Filipina Narciso, were framed, scapegoated and harassed by the FBI and other US law enforcement in the 1970s. They were framed 
with um, these murders that happened at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so this caused his family um, about three years of, of an ordeal with court visits and um, his mother was actually imprisoned for a period of time and eventually the case was dropped. And I believe also there was a nurse supervisor who eventually confessed to the crimes before she herself committed suicide. Um, but the US, the government never made any kind of apology to his family. Um, but Jason has created a lot of poetry. Um, I think of poetry as being a very broad range of artist, artistic expression. Um, and so we're going to look at a couple, just a, a few short clips of the volumes of work that he's made regarding this uh, history. And so I'm going to invite Jason to introduce his pieces. Jason. Thank you, Joyce, um, for that introduction. And thank you, Cool Arts um, staff and, and folks um, putting this really important discussion together. I'm always excited when um, Alalia Yapanis is, is uh, endeavoring on a new project and I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of it. Um, and so I, I think before Joyce and I get into conversation, we're gonna screen a few clips from uh, two works that are a part of this kind of a long, broader uh, body of work, poetic work, I guess, um, interdisciplinary poetic work, Joyce. Uh, um, uh, and uh, they kind of go in, in uh, a reverse chronological order. So the first one is a film called Stranger Here. And it's sort of a film performance that's based on a monologue that I assembled from oral histories with my mother about her arrest, right? And so she kind of talks about that experience of, of being arrested um, and kind of what happened in, in that initial, at that very initial moment. Um, and so, uh, and and uh, I, I have uh, two performers reading uh, that monologue, uh, uh, the great Golda Sargento and Jamie Nales, um, who are both Bay Area based um, artists, uh, also interdisciplinary artists, I would say. Um, and then uh, the second piece is called Yoni Narrate, so that Stranger Here came I finished that in 2015, I think. Um, uh, Yoni Narrates um, comes in 2009, actually for a project for Cool Arts. Um, it's part of a larger project called The Passion of El Hulk Hogancito. Um, and it's sort of the first time I gathered the guts to talk to my mom about this case. Um, and the way that I did it, and, and you'll see it, it, she's, uh, uh, reading from her prison diaries um, and reflecting, and we're kind of having a casual conversation. I can elaborate a little bit further, but that should give you sufficient framing for, for looking at these shorter clips. I was a small kid before, and I played, and I like to be a nurse and I get those dragonfly, you know the one? And I get my needle and I inject them with water. My sister says, why do you do that? Because I want to be a nurse. One of these days, I will gonna be one. They're so neat. They're white clothes, uniforms, shoes, cap and all those. I think they don't die because they're so nice and so clean. They don't die because they're helping people. I told Tatai, you have to send me to school. One thing is, the only way I can see America is to be a nurse. Tatai said no. You can't go because they killed those nurses in Chicago. That was back in that time. When I leave to come here, Nanai and Tata is crying and crying. Tata said, if you find a nice guy, marry him. You're getting old. When I arrived, <clears throat> America, it's too far. It's like another world. 
Hindi maganda ang America. I'm lonely. I have no friends. I work nights. Then I met your dad. Everyone said, Oh, you have a partner now for the Valentine's. It's a dance in the hospital. Who is that? Your dad, he said. Oh, you're going? Then we're all going. We dance and dance. And later on, when I know him, he called me. He come to the house. We were boyfriends for six months. We go out. We take the train. Then he said, if you want me, I'll stay. If not, then I'll just go to Japan with my brother. If I stay, we'll continue. If not, then we don't know. That time he worked in St. Francis in the laundry department. He said, if you like me, then we just get married. If not, then maybe I'm not coming back. I go home after Japan. Okay, I said, when? It was a big wedding. Our invitation is made in the Philippines. We had a reception in a Chinese restaurant. That was a nice love story. And then, June 16, 1976, a horrible day. The FBI came to my work and arrested me. I didn't do anything. The FBI was mean. They kept trying to get me to confess. I felt suffocated. What did they do? I said, I didn't do anything. He said, get in the car. It was in the street when they arrested me. In Chicago? In Chicago. And then when we got down, they covered my head back with my sweater, with my coat. Why? That, I don't know, it's crazy, the FBI. And then, suddenly I was in TV all over the place. What, what's the American dream, Mom? You don't have to read that anymore, just tell me. The Amer There's no American dream, is bullshit. <laughs> That's it? That's it. Because I don't believe in American justice. There was no justice when we were on trial. And one thing is, I didn't want to be a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. I resented that. I really didn't want That's why I didn't get my U.S. citizen for a long time. Because I said I don't want it. Because I don't believe in justice. There was no justice in this country. Okay, so I'm just gonna have a short discussion here. So just so everyone knows the way this is gonna work, we're gonna go, every artist is going to present and I'll have a little conversation and then all artists will come together for a, to converse with each other and then we'll take audience questions. So um, I guess I'll just start by asking you, Jason, you know, I've seen this story come through your, body like you enacting your younger self you reading poetry that you wrote about it um and in this case it's coming through other actors and then also you then directing your your mother um and working in different media you know some live performance and these are films i'm just curious like how how working in these different forms has had a different um effect or maybe you had a different intention with each one could you talk about that a bit yeah i think you know the the um i i originally actually set out to write a novel right and so i think you know i i um and and i just was pulled in a lot of different directions um uh thanks to like alleluia and kind of in, inviting me to think about performance as a medium um, and then, you know, I, I think that, you know, I started to explore uh, performance a little bit more seriously in film and video, 
right? And film and video sort of got, I was teaching at an art school and it was inspired by a lot of my students. And so I think that, you know, just exploring these different modes of uh, performance was, was really important to me. Um, uh, because I, I think that there was, there was something about, you know, being able to explore the history or sort of pursue, I guess, you know, the, the, the impulse to, to rewrite history or the historiographical impulse um, in a distributed way, right? And so with all of these films and both, but like Yoni narrates and Just a Stranger here, I only worked with people I 100% absolutely trusted with the story and for them to be in proximity either to my mother's words or my mother herself, right? And so in Stranger here in that first one, um, you know, but the, 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 the team that I assembled, the performer, performers and, and Golda and Jamie, I mean, these are folks who I, I respect a lot and, and that we kind of go back to a, a certain poetry scene in the late 90s, early 2000s. And so I thought, you know, I was a fan of their work. Um, you know, the, the director uh, who, who was mostly kind of taking charge of the directing of that, that, that film was my, one of my best friends, Diane Q. Um, uh, Wilfred, Wilfred uh, Galila and Cool Arts is uh, the, the, the camera genius behind that work. Um, and then my editor was a student that I worked with named Vixi Apacible, right? And so those are all people who I had a relationship with um, uh, uh, outside of art, right? And so, uh, and so I think that um, just being able to, to create an experience and explore that story together was, was just, I mean, that was the more important part to me, right? That collaboration, right? And I think with Yoni narrates, you know, the the, the editor was was a friend of mine named Mark Marcello, um, who's a filmmaker and a DJ, and and we just had a lot of conversations on what, uh, how to kind of capture very candidly my mom experiencing it, uh, her journals again, you know, that sort of trauma but with her full humanity, right? And all the opportunities for her to refuse certain emotion or affect, right? Uh, um, in going back there and like putting on whatever performance face that she needed to, to get the story out. And I, I, I learned a lot by just kind of um, moving from the, from the written sort of forms of these, these works and then just kind of trying a bunch of different things to see how to represent it in community, right? I think that I, not that I don't don't that I think writing is uh, um, doesn't have those possibilities, but I was really drawn to um, the opportunity to to collaborate, and I and I took a lot of cues, um, at least for as my film and video work progressed. I took a lot of cues from a, one of my dear mentors when I was doing my PhD, um, who's a, a a black feminist filmmaker by the name of Zainabu Davis, um, who was um, a big part of the LA Rebellion, uh, which is a group of uh, black filmmakers coming out of UCLA. And a lot of their ethos was around collaboration and collaborative vision and solidarity, um, but also their aesthetics. I was drawn to their aesthetics, you know, um, really kind of in the moment of third cinema and, you know, urgent kind of intimate, rough, uh, sort of aesthetics. And so I think all of those uh, forms I, 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 and all of those gestures I found within um, a, a blend of all of these different forms of embodiment and performance, but also the interfacing with technology, knowing full well, it takes me like a million years to edit like a minute, right? For film, and I, I don't consider myself a filmmaker, but I, I think being in conversation and collaboration with other artists, I mean, that's sort of what I, why I'm, I'm interested in pursuing, you know, um, the, the projects that I do pursue. So. Yeah, and I, I think I remember reading somewhere also you saying at a certain point in your young adulthood, like realizing that you needed to kind of take control of this story and tell it, or your family needed to tell it, um, or that you had this worst fear that some white dude was gonna come <laughs> Book about it, some um, some wrong wrong account. Um, but I'm I'm curious how it was working with your mom and uh and thank you um our magical tech people put the Vimeo link. Um, oh great! 
so that I really encourage people to watch the full films because the Yoni narrates, um, I find it very moving because it's not just an interview with your mom, like you're in it, like we see the process of you in the home, like you're, it's, you know, you're directing your mom to tell her story. Um, but, you know, last week someone told me, you know, we are the hands and heart of our parents. So it's, it's in both of your bodies, but in different ways. And so I was wondering, and you've also used this term to talk about the, like the critical lyrical imagination of your mom. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit of how it was to work with her on that. Yeah, I, I remember, you know, in, in college when I started really exploring this story a little further, um, the, my initial thought was like, oh, I'm gonna, just going to collaborate with my mom. <laughs> On a like a poem or something, uh, and that didn't work, work out, right? And so, um, you know, I, I think that uh, when it comes to this notion of the critical lyrical imagination, I think I'm I'm thinking more like when I'm thinking about critical, I'm thinking about yeah, you know, critique and the kind of uh, critical traditions through which I'm kind of um, trying to think about things like ethnography and interview and um, you know research methodologies and uh, you know. Um, and, and uh, how I'm trying to get the story out, you know, um, and then, uh, but I'm also thinking about the the other another connotation of critical as in vital, right? Um, and so, I think that you know the lyrical imagination I, I propose is a sort of not as a rough, a, a hard and cut alternative to the narrative, but a kind of response to a sort of narrative linearity or a sort of factual kind of accounting of what happened. And so there's much more play in terms of the associative move of how my mother tells her story. So you go from like, it, it gives more space for like different differences in affect, in tone, in moments, in description. She's laughing. She's a little serious pauses, right? So instead of trying to sort of discipline her and say, stick to the script, mom, and tell the story, right? Being able to learn how she does it and being able to come up with the vocabulary so that I could kind of draw power from it because I'm my mother's punso, right? I'm her son. So I know I tell stories in the same way, right? I know that my punchlines hit and fall or miss in the same exact way, right? And so being able to think about how I could pursue that and learn from her, like what, how she tells a story and where, like it gives a space for her to move through her memory because it's violent, it's trauma, right? And so her being able to move through this sort of memory of state violence, but that her style affords her multiple moments to refuse, Right? to refuse to tell a story, to refuse to go down a particular path, to refuse to reproduce an image of herself as a victim, right? And so, it, you know, it, it kind of gives her a lot more dimensions of humanity than I think, um, I don't think folks who, other folks who have access to her story in some, in different ways could could tell it, right? And so I think that being able to, to really, um, uh, Take 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 the opportunity. It's a unique opportunity for for mother and son to interact and produce work in that way. And so I I, I thought you know um, I, I'm learned you know I learned a lot about structure and my own inclinations and my own aesthetic um, sensibilities. In line with that, did your mother share with you, or you could speak personally, if how working on these projects over the years have perhaps affected your process as a human being, um, <laughs> or, um, your families, you know, how it's impacted your family's processing of this traumatic event, as you said. Yeah, I, I think they come to expect it now <laughs> that I'm gonna explore this, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually learning a lot about how to be patient with the story and that it's, it's about assembling the body of work and fetishizing a, a kind of, singular work that tries to get the story right. I'm not interested in that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sort of interested in the process, right? I, I think that's the word you use and what you see in my work is that I'm interested in, in not fetishizing the object or the project, right? It's performance, it's performance studies, right? It's the, the, the process through which 
we come to to knowing things or not knowing things or refusing to know things. And so I think you know I've learned about a lot about you know the patience and um, uh, and, and and having a willingness to experiment, uh, but I've also grown incredibly empathetic. I feel like I'm more generous in terms of, you know, with myself in terms of how I want the story to come out or how I give to the collaboration either between my mother or other artists for the story to unfold naturally in the way that it does, right? So I think that, you know, um, uh, instead of kind of going in as the sun and sort of cannibalizing my mother's story and saying, here, I'm going to represent it and I'm going to do it right, right? Being able to kind of bring all of these different tools and all the people and people that I love and respect to collaborate with me and say, hey, I think that this story actually impacts us. It haunts our community, right? Um, I know that because I performed in community spaces where elders have come to talk to me about it and or I have friends who've talked to their parents and grandparents about it, right? And so I think you know, being able to attend to these histories collectively is is important. And so that's been important in, in recent ways that I've approached the work to, to kind of hear, you know, that, that yes, I have, uh, you know, a, a certain training or a certain aesthetic, like, impulse, but I, but I also uh, like the, the, the experiment and the, and the potential, the, the potential or the possibilities that come out of kind of relinquishing, you know, the, the control of the story, right? I didn't want to be an imperialist, right, about the story and be like, I'm going to colonize the story and say, I'm the son, so I get to tell it. Not even that should be easy, right? It, it, and I think that, that that's sort of what I try to kind of work with when I talk to students too, it's just like, we don't have automatic access to any story that we want, right? And even then we have to think really critically and meditate about the forms through which we tell these stories because, you know, and, and, and who are audiences, frankly, right? And so I think it's, it's um, really getting me, get, you know, helping me think about audience and community and, and, and things like that. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. So, so Jason will be back, but uh, right now we're going to move on to Jennifer, looking at some of Jennifer Wofford's work. So I'm going to do a quick intro of Jennifer Wofford, who is a San Francisco-based artist and educator whose work plays with notions of hybridity, authenticity, and global culture, often with a humorous bent. She is one third of the Filipina American artist trio Mob, that's M-O-B for Mail Order Brides. Um, and her work has been exhibited in museums and other spaces all over the world in San Francisco, Hong Kong, the Philippines, and Malaysia. Uh, she's a 2017 recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant. She's also been artist in residence at the Living Room in the Philippines. Uh, Liguria Study Center in Italy and Kino Kino in Norway. She's right now teaching as full-time faculty or part-time faculty. Uh, maybe she should be teaching as full-time faculty at um, in fine arts at and Philippine studies at the University of San Francisco. And she's also taught at UC Berkeley at Mills College and San Francisco Art Institute, California College of the Arts and San Francisco State University. Please welcome Jennifer Wofford. She has the slide show for us, I believe she's gonna talk us through. Hi everyone. Let me just uh, go through the comedy of getting this thing loaded up and we'll get rolling. Hi. I have just discovered the exciting correlation between uh, PowerPoint presenter view and Zoom. You think I would have figured this out sooner, but I'll take what I can get. Okay, hopefully not probably seeing that yet. Let's go to share screen and let's see if it's working. Yeah, All right, go. hot diggity. Let me get my timer running and the show is on the road. So, um, hi guys. Uh, as many of you know, on September 12th, 20, uh, September uh, 21st, 1972, uh, Marcos declared martial law in the Philippines. And so this particular era, hot on the heels of the 1965 um, major immigration, uh, immigration policies in the U.S., 
I think sets into motion this project that I did a few years back called Floor 1973 to 1978. Uh, and this was a public art project that was displayed on Market Street. Um, and it was six narrative posters that were set between San Francisco and Manila, mostly in San Francisco. And so this image from the series is part of this mega mix, a very quick and fast and lots of slides and mega mix of nurse inspired art projects that I'm going to discuss right now. Um, so you already saw in the AJ Plus video some mention and some interviews with the great Kathy Choi, who I was lucky to study with as a grad student at UC Berkeley. Um, and so I always need to give a shout out to this book and how influential it was to me in my work. Um, and as I was having a classic grad school crisis, uh, and not really sure who I was making work for or why, um, I took a class with Kathy, which was not about nurses, but it got me thinking about Filipino narratives um, and where I could be telling stories in my own work. So big shocker here, my mom's a nurse too. Um, and here's a picture of her looking very cute and a student nursey with uh, my Auntie Kaz. And this is in Portland, which is not maybe the traditional nurse story, but maybe there really isn't a traditional nurse story. We'll get into that separately. Is your mom on the left or the right? Uh, my mom is on the right. Ah. Yes. Um, and so I started doing these drawings while I was in grad school. So these are around 2006. Um, and these nurses were rendered with a crisp black and white ink uh, on an institutional, clinical, pale green paper. And they were situated in what I conceived of as a sort of nebulous, gooey, border type space. Uh, they were both in between worlds, but kind of of both. And the drawings were very intentionally small and quiet. Like they were really only like 10 by 15 inches for the most part. A couple of them were larger, like 15 by 20. Um, and so, yes, my mother's a nurse, but this project was, in, was not her story in the same way that Jason's work is very, very clearly his mother's story. Um, I was really looking at her as my, my point of entry of sorts into these narratives that I felt connected to. I will say that my mother's work was as a wound care specialist. And so the many times that I saw her working on photos of wounds uh, in the process of healing or worsening uh, left me really compelled by this idea of um, this sticky, visceral place between worlds. And it certainly governed my choices to render these spaces as, as sticky and lumpy and corporeal. Uh, and so there were probably 20 or 30 of these that I had done. Um, and so this work led me pretty quickly into uh, what was my MFA thesis show at the time. God, that's so long ago, uh, which was a project called Point of Departure. And I think at this point, I felt like I had a lot more work to do around nurses, but I wanted to move beyond them being these uh, anonymous blank slates and into uh, something that allowed me to insert more narrative into the story. And so for this project, I ended up making 40 small ink and gouache paintings uh, that were all interlinked, a bit like a puzzle. And so this is the project in its original installation. And uh, my logic here was that it was almost like a crossword puzzle of sorts, that, that the images interlinked vertically or horizontally or diagonally. Uh, and here are some close-ups of that so that it's maybe a little clearer. So you can see the, uh, the visual through lines as the series begins. Um, young Filipina nurse leaving her island uh, and being processed through some sort of uh, academic setting into a more industrialized Western antiseptic setting. And um, there were very intentionally gaps uh, in the narrative where uh, viewers could uh, basically plug in whatever they felt like it. And this work has also been uh, displayed in, in various combinations, iterations, to construct different kinds of narratives. And so I thought that that was a really interesting premise uh, at the time that I've revisited in varying other ways in my projects since. Um, but the logic kind of falls apart in this particular project as it goes from something that feels like a linear narrative into like, I don't know why there's a giant nurse foot thing happening in this image in the bottom right or why there's suddenly a giant durian floating in a cloud by the end of the series, and then everything gets tangled up in some branches and a bunch of bandages. So I think that it's really important in my work to, to do the research, to get the historical facts right, uh, to interview folks as needed, but then to still allow for that thing which is artistic license. And so what this work led into was a much more specific project with a real st strong narrative order, which is uh, San Francisco, uh, Arts Commission's Art on Market Street program. So this project still runs to this day. Now these kinds of posters are in the bus shelters, but uh, in 2008 when I did these, these were in kiosks up and down Market Street. 
So um, I was com commissioned to do six posters, each of which I decided was uh, six, uh, one of six years in the life of this young Filipino nurse who had just emigrated to the United States. And so, as many of you know, the 70s were a particularly fraught time, a very potent time in both Manila and San Francisco. And so I looked at these posters as a way to talk through this dynamic of the, the Filipino nurse, but also just really to give her a whole rich inner life and to talk about these political histories. And so in the first poster, I did a lot of these kinds of parallels where um, in, on this day in history, uh, you know, Skylab was the space station that was uh, returning to Earth or was going into, uh, sorry, going into orbit. And so I like that idea of her being launched into orbit as well. Um, and in this particular poster, it really talks about her ambivalence about leaving the United States, uh, leaving the Philippines, and coming to the U.S. Um, but also the conditions for leaving, right? That there are reasons. There's a there's a real heavy human cost uh, as you leave family behind. Um, you know, since Marco said establishment martial law in 1972. Um, by 1973, when I set this poster, its full effects would have been extremely obvious, right? And so rather than making 1965's Heart Seller Act the simple or singular reason for Flora's emigration, I wanted it to be clear that the situation in the Philippines was fairly dire, that Flora had a brother who had disappeared, and this was putting pressure on her to leave and take care of her family. So here she is arriving in San Francisco. Um, as the series progresses, you know, by the next year, she settled into her, her work life in, in San Francisco. It's a fairly subdued poster. After some of the, the, the drama of the first poster, I wanted this to attend to some of the more mundane aspects of any immigration narrative, which is like, yo, there are some steep hills in San Francisco, and it is really tedious walking up them. And so I just needed those, those kinds of moments, not exactly levity, but just um, something a little softer. Um, and just these dreamy moment of her staring out a window with the fog, as I think we all do every once in a while. Um, here is, of course, a uh, shout out to St. Luke's Hospital, may it rest in peace, on the left. Uh, so I had actually interviewed uh, an older Filipino nurse who had worked in that hospital since the 70s, and some of her stories helped me construct the, the narratives I was creating for my fictional character of Flora. Um, also on the far on the right image, there's kind of just a little bit of a shout out to paperwork because we don't talk enough about how terrible paperwork is and how much a part of this process everything is. Um, yeah, so by 75, ideally, Floor would have been able to take a trip home. So I paralleled this with that moment in 1975, which was the great Muhammad Ali Joe Frazier Joe Frazier fight, which was known as the Thrilla in Manila, and so that is why the poster is called Thrilla. And of course, this is a moment in which uh, the, uh, the America's Ima had briefly been back on the Philippines, just as Flora is returning home. So, you know, here she is at the airport. She's got the Balak buy-in boxes. She's meeting family. Um, all of the classic uh, moments of the transnational experience, the in-between, the coming and going, the returning, the leaving again. By 76, uh, this was the big bicentennial year in the U.S. It also happens to be the only year in any recent record that uh, it snowed in substantial amounts in the Bay Area. Um, some of you may have seen the Snow Day essays on uh, the San Francisco Chronicle about this. And so I thought, how would a kind of a net magical moment it might be for this, this girl from the tropics to go up to Twin Peaks and to see snow for herself very delightedly for the first time. Also, uh, was the, between the bicentennial year thing and the election year thing, there was a lot happening in 1976 that I wanted to incorporate. Um, so on the image on the left, you have one of Jimmy Carter's actual campaign posters from that year, um, which I just love, this, this creepy peanut, so I just needed a shout out to that moment. But you know, when I did these posters in 2008, um, we had not yet elected Barack Obama. And so I was feeling very pointed in this particular moment of addressing this idea of we were hoping for something new after some years of a bad situation prior to that. Um, can't imagine how we're going through that again, gang. Um, and I also wanted to create a moment of levity here, right, which is showing Floor on the right, uh, just more comfortable in her surroundings, just clowning a little bit with friends at work, um, that gave her just more expressiveness, more agency, less of this drone-like anonymous uh, figure in, in, at work. By 77, like any good Filipina activist, she would have just showed up at the I-Hotel uh, to, to protest and to protect 
the Malongs there. And so I felt like this was a nice opportunity to talk about that particular history and the intersections of how many things were happening in um, Manila Town slash Chinatown at that particular era. And so once again, we have a, a, a gratuitous shout out to the International Hotel on the left and uh, a shot up Kearney Street from uh, basically from the I Hotel's viewpoint um, of floor wandering around in this neighborhood. And so here we again have Floor getting her activist groove on. By the final poster in the series, um, Floor has now established herself well enough to petition to bring her family over, right? This is the, this is the way the sagas conclude, kind of, right? That it's not just this clean departure and then remove, you know, arrival. There are all these uh, family connections that are part of this moment. 78 was a heavy year in the Bay Area, as many of you know. This was the Jonestown massacres. This was the murders of uh, Supervisor Harvey Milk and uh, Mayor George Moscone. And so this poster was about the unraveling of a few different things in the city. So here you see her reading the poster about that. You see uh, the sort of swan song to San Francisco as it once was, as people, as families reunite, they leave and they move to the suburbs. And of course, by the final poster, here she is just waiting at the airport for them to arrive. Um, the last image I'm just going to show here is a one-off painting uh, called MacArthur Nurses. Some of you know this very famous image uh, from World War II of General Douglas MacArthur and others. Who are those others, you may ask? Uh, landing on Leyte in 1944, which has been, of course, translated into this god-awful sculpture, um, which I just love because it is, it is godlike in scale. Um, but we could have a long sec secondary conversation about this photo alone. All you need to know for our purposes is that uh, I had to do this in relation to that. And so maybe we can talk about that, Joyce, I, or maybe not. Yes. <laughs> yeah, did you want to say more about that? <laughs> I just was trying to manage my time very carefully. But you know, you are right on time. <laughs> Did you, did you want to say something more about that last piece? I could, oh, girl, I could talk too long about it, I think. Um, mostly it's just that it has such a weird place in, I think, the American consciousness and to some degree the Philippine consciousness. Um, I've always found it really problematic how it centers, you know, MacArthur as this, this singular hero narrative, when in fact, you know, on the, cut out a frame right there is, you know, President Sergio Osmeña and, of course, like, Carlos Romulo is in this photo and all these other like kind of legendary figures are part of this collaborative moment. It's also, you know, been often argued this was a falsified image, that it was photographed a couple times, that it was restaged here. You know, there's a lot of weird things about the image. But I think more than anything, I like this idea that it was this, um, whether it was fictionalized or not, this moment of return, of somehow making good on a promise. But I wanted to upend that. Um, and make the narrative about something else that I was more interested in. Oh, absolutely. I really enjoyed watching the, the journey of Floor just now because I, I hadn't watched it in that sequence before. Um, but I, I think just that, you know, contextualizing the history and then because, you know, how nurses were kind of subject to the whims of, of the US government and the Philippine government in a way, this humanization of, of the life. I'm, I'm curious if any nurses responded to you about the work or what kind of feedback you got from the community. The floor series? Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of the feedback I was getting was secondhand, to be fair, because um, they were it was in on Market Street. And what I would get is a lot of folks coming back who like were creeping up on convert when they would see a group of Filipinos huddled around the posters, they would be like, this is what they said. And it was generally, um, at least not, I didn't get reported back anything particularly critical so much as I think just that moment where we see ourselves in art that um, is a, a nice moment of recognition. Um, I tried to be as, as honest and accurate as I could in terms of translating um, the stories that I had gotten from some nurses, like specifically this woman who I'd hung out with at, at uh, St. Luke's Hospital, um, tried to weave her narrative into floors without making it about her. And then you, you use this term, like um, also the kind of playfulness, that the whimsicalness, the durian, the Marianne. I love Marianne in the chat, by the way. I just want to say, <laughs> I appreciate all your comments. I, I see you and I appreciate all your support. 
comment um, that, that you said, I love the shoes and I, I love the durian. And, um, but there is this, you know, you use the word nebulous and you've used like mysterious, the goo. Can you talk more about the goo <laughs> and what, what that, how that came about? And I am stuck in my work in constant in, uh, relation to just states of liminality. Like I just like stuff that is neither solid nor liquid. I like the, the portal of a doorway. Um, uh, I like these moments of immigration and transition. Um, I, I think it's just endlessly compelling to me. Um, I think that's as close to autobiographical as it gets. I think just for me being mixed, growing up a lot of different places, being of the Bay Area, but not, uh, that I think factors into why I keep returning to those kinds of motifs in the work. Um, and I think that honestly, we all deal with it, right? Which is that tension point between who we present as and who we are internally. Um, and it's just a really, really, really thin veil at times. And then um, I really like the the way that the point of departure uh, drawings or paintings can, can be rearranged in different ways. You said like a crossword puzzle. Um, and I, in that way, I feel like the, the work keeps moving or the spirit stays alive and evolving in a way. Um, I don't know if you have more to say about that piece and the different arrangements of it. I think it's just that we all construct narratives in lots of different ways. Uh, and sometimes it's, it seems linear and then sometimes you realize there's a whole side story you need to, to go on. Or sometimes you forgot a detail and you need to go back for that thing. And then really time compresses into space where it doesn't really matter what happened first or second. It's just an experience and, and a feeling in a moment. You know, it all collapses on itself to some extent. Marianne says this should be a graphic novel. Is that a thank you, Marianne? Is that in a workings, maybe, or have you thought about that? It has been brought up more than once, um, and I think honestly, it boils down to I'm just too lazy. Uh, <laughs> I'm a I'm a very slow artist. I will say that, and so when I commit to a project, I just know that I'm in for um, a, a long a long ride with something. If you just need an assistant. <laughs> I'll take that too. We'll, we'll, we'll put a call out. Um, an agent. Okay, Marianne says you need an agent. I'm waiting. <laughs> all right, okay. So if anyone on Facebook out there sees this. <laughs> all right, okay. Well, thank you very much. I think we're gonna move on to Alali and we'll come back into conversation with you shortly. So thank you very much. And uh, now I'm going to introduce, uh, Lilia introduced me, I'm going to introduce her back. That's how we do. <laughs> um, so I'm going to honor back uh, my mentor and friend. She is the driving force behind Cool Arts, a respected elder artist in the US and the Philippines. Alleluia uh, is one of the founding members of Cool Arts. Uh, she served as the director since 1985 and also has created 20, 20 full length <laughs> dance theater works since 1985. Uh, this is a, there's a long list of accolades and awards. She received awards for her choreography from the Wallace Alexander Gerbodi Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, uh, San Francisco Arts Commission, California Arts Council, uh, New Langton Art Creative Work Fund, I have to take a breath. Edit, edit. <laughs> she was a board member of RAPA for Women in the Art Bay Area Dance Coalition. Um, artist, she's been an artist committee member of National Performance Network. I've seen her at that conference. Uh, and she's also been a juror for the Ethnic Dance Festival. She received the Dancers Group Dancers Choice Award in oh my 2000. Gosh. <laughs> I didn't review this. <laughs> She I'm sorry. <laughs> was a 210 fellow at the James P. Shannon Leadership Institute and Rockwood Leadership, Rockwood Leadership Institute in 2012. I'm almost done. She was awarded the prestigious 2017 San Francisco Arts Commission Artist Legacy Award, uh, 2019 to 20 Gerbodi Special Artist Award, 2019 to 2020 Dance USA Artist Fellow, and finally, the 2020 Hewlett 50 Arts Commission Award. Please welcome Alleluia Hanis. 
Yes. So all of you out there, you stick to it and they'll finally give you some money. <laughs> so. uh, thank you, Joyce. Uh, I think I'm going to show films or videos, clips of videos, and then we can talk from there. So um, thank you for that. I will, I will add that I started stalking out Leah in the 90s because I, I saw her choreography and I was like, who's this badass person, you know, with this, uh, you know, such strong modern, yeah, modern dance technique. Um, and everyone talked about, oh, Ellie, she can do 16 pirouettes. Um, and then I, I, <laughs> I went and took a dance workshop with her. Um, uh, at Bindle Stiff and was able to go on a tribal tour with her to, to Mindanao 
uh, which kind of ties back to this whole uh, point that Jennifer brought up about research and then kind of take, you know, putting that research through your own vision, I guess. Um, so I thought maybe you could talk about um, how your research, your interests have kind of resulted in these projects over the years and your turn to film, to dance film. Um, hmm. It's, you know, as an artist, I, I think I totally agree with, uh, uh, with Jennifer as well in the kinds of things uh, that we need to learn, to know, um, to tell the stories. And um, I guess for me, growing up um, and being in the society, there's always a sense of displacement, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a child of immigrant, as an immigrant myself, and that sense of um, survival, you know, you work, work, work. And um, so in going back to the Philippines and, and learning more, my idea is not so much to, um, to represent, to do a representative kind of uh, work, but how would that uh, get infused into the works that I do um, and find meaning um, and, um, and also find, um, you know, the wholeness in ourselves, embracing um, our history, our experiences, and, you know, our indigenous practices or uh, practices that um, has been um, gaslit or gaslighted by colonization and we do it ourselves. So those are uh, really, really super interesting to me and, um, um, and what I needed and what I want in my life now. And even as, you know, growing up and not finding those st stories um, that I can resonate with. And, um, and I feel really profoundly lucky uh, to make a living with um, what I do um, and to be able to um, tell our narratives um, and kind of, and really kind of dig beyond the statistics um, find the extraordinary and the ordinary lives of our folks, of ourselves. Um, it's a gift. It's, a, it's an opportunity. It's, a, it's an honor and a sense of agency of being able to, um, to tell our truths and embrace that and um, find ourselves in the process. Thank you. Um... Is there, is there anything else you wanted to say about these two clips before we invite the other two folks back? No. <laughs> okay, okay, I was just checking. All right, okay, well, um, before we invite Jason and Jennifer um, back to the screen, um, I do need to, to acknowledge that this panel, Nurse Narratives in the Arts, is being presented by Cool Arts in partnership with the Filipino American Development Foundation. And also um, thank you for your support from the Bulasan Center of Filipino Studies at UC Davis and Yerba Buena Arts and Events. Uh, this project is also funded by the Hewlett Foundation and San Francisco Arts mm -hmm. Commission. Um, oh, and we're gonna see a little slide. About that.
Thank you, Eric. Okay, and now I want to invite all the panelists to start your video and come back. Um, hi, <laughs> welcome back, everybody. So uh, now I just uh, want to have a little converse, little ten minute conversation with with all of you. I guess you know back to the community thing as Alleluia is embarking on this project, nursing the wounds, uh, which I should say is going to premiere next 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 fall. Um, at Yerba Buena and as an outdoor site specific piece and then it will also become a performance and, and also the film similar to the ones you just saw. Um, this is sort of to, to bring together the community and to, to look at like the, the work on nurses that has already been done um, and have a conversation. So I wonder if initially there's any comments or questions that you have for each other after viewing each other's work. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. How do you how do you get started? Like for me, that's the hardest damn thing. That's a real question. I mean, I mean for me, it sort of have to. It wakes me up at night, or you know, it comes to me like what subject is interesting or. And so then it won't stop, you know, it nags. So <laughs> okay, I better get started on it. Um, and then if the funding comes through, then I'm going, okay, the Diwatas want it, you know? Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like my, my go-to. How about you, Jason? Yeah, you know, I um, I think it's similar. I, I like what you said, Alleluia, when you you know in um, you know talking about like not wanting it to be like a kind of uh, realistic or simplistic kind of representation, right, of of these stories, and, and perhaps to you that's a little bit of what I'm what I kind of understood about your work, also Jennifer, in terms of like you know allowing that sort of poetic or, or artistic or creative license to sort of be in conversation with the subject matter, right? Um, I think for me, as recently, I, I, not, maybe not recently, within the last um, couple of years, I've been sort of interested in, in I, I've been fighting to give myself permission to sort of like be really intentional about my kind of intellectual obsessions, right? And, and wanting to pursue a line of inquiry or explore and know these things, but then also being able to pinpoint a moment where I'm like, well, what's stopping me from figuring out how to turn this into a work, right? Like, instead of like creating that kind of end all work, but having that process, right? Being able to kind of say, well, I don't have all, excuse me, I don't have all the archive. I haven't done all the interviews, but I'm gonna just make that interview a part of the live work, right? And so that it, so it has like this other sort of life. And so I think I am, I, I think I, you know, maybe kind of going back to that, like this, this notion of like making, like I'm always making, right? Uh, um, even if when I'm not. Um, and so being able to, to um, feel confident or comfortable in, in inviting people into that process, right? Because I think there's something really generative about um, about that. So I think that's how I get started is starting with conversations and going down that that those lines or doing, going into that rabbit hole and <laughs> that pursuit being part of the, a big part of the work, you know? I mean, I also see, you know, I see you all as activists and, you know, art activists. And it, and I think back to um, the clip where Jason, your mom said, there's no American justice. Um, and so I was thinking, cause this has been up a lot in the news with like the Derek Chauvin trial and stuff that, you know, there was, there was no conventional justice or like in the case of your mom, it's another case of racist state violence where there's not, conventional you know there's not and maybe chasing that kind of justice from the government is not is like a waste of energy in a way so but there's maybe there is like 
poetic justice or there's a different, there's a different, um, so I'm just trying to like formulate some question around ju justice and, and the works that you're doing or uh, alternative something. Um, if any of you have something, <laughs> if that sparks anything for any of you. I, I guess for me, like if, if you, uh, as we were watching uh, Sundo um, Manong Balang Goes to Heaven, um, and it's really kind of a response to uh, the heaven narrative of the West, you know, the Catholic Church just taking that over and, um, and, and coming up with what, what is heaven and remembering my grandmother uh, when she is upset would say something like, you know, don't sass me. Uh, you, you, I was already a being before, uh, and you were just water. And so the whole notion of us um, going back to water and that fear of water, and um, and the deities coming to pick you up, um, is it was so powerful for me to kind of like kind of understand that and what she was saying and how um, you know we're looking for. Uh, just a, our own kind of like outlook in life. I mean, we're island people. And so the water is a sacred place. So uh, at, the, at the same time, we, uh, we're not throwing away the, the, the Catholic precepts, you know, like it's all included, it's all part of it as the nurse puts the, the cross and there's a Santo Nino on the side of her, his bed. It's like, that's okay. You know, and I think that's sort of like the kind of collaboration um, we were talking about earlier, or y'all were talking about earlier in this panel, is also the collaboration, the conglomeration, the infusion of the halo halo, right? That becomes kind of this delicious thing that keeps us going. Classic. Uh, I'm gonna need to circle back around and talk to you about this water thing. Um, as the, the next project I'm doing, is actually about uh, the, the Philippine American diver, Vicky Manalo Draves. Um, and one of the images that keeps coming up for me that is part of me trying to get started on this project is not so much all the public facing things, which are her achievements as an Olympian, um, as this kind of very pretty young thing, posing for photos, doing Hollywood things. It, the image that comes back to me over and over and over again is just her beneath the surface after she's died, she's done the dive and she hasn't emerged yet and she's just in this space that's entirely her own. And so there's something in that that I'm, I, I need to talk to you. I guess that relates to this notion of uh, like the politics of, of care. And I know Ali was interested in nursing these wounds to, to talk about like traditional notions of wellness versus Jennifer talked about this pro processing in the, the American education of, of nurses or other folks. Um, any comments around these notions of wellness, care, and how your work relates to these concepts? I guess just in the sense that um, what I've been doing with that with those earlier nurse projects, and I honestly think it's going to come up with this Vicky Draves project too, is just trying to remove these 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 women's narratives from this place of them performing care for others or only being as useful as they are as as their their skill set um, presents them to be. And I think that there's something about who is caring for them and who is honoring their stories and who is letting their stories be something other than just this functional like. Uh, productive thing that there are side trips and there are all sorts of weird things that are happening. Uh, the internal journey, uh, to me, that's part of the, the saga of care. Thank you. Uh, I think we we do have questions coming in the chat, and I'm not sure if Wilfred, there are questions from Facebook that you that you have. Um, uh, there's a question from Marianne in the chat. In the wake of Black Lives Matter, do you see more attention being paid to Filipino Americans? Says the most quote unquote Black of Asians, LOL. Hmm. Or, or, you know, the weekly question that uh, yeah. designation as well. 
I honestly haven't. <laughs> I think the short answer I have is no. Hmm. I just I think that that's you know the media or someone else is always telling you know a narrative that may not be right or may not be correct or may not be true to ourselves and I think for myself as an artist as a human being um, I don't know whether I don't pay attention but I look at it as like okay this is another you know kind of like a, a colonized thought divide and conquer. Um, and all of that and really kind of just have a longer view of history and why things happen the way they do. Um, we don't even need to look at um, black folks. We can also just look within, you know, kind of the Filipino community themselves and the infighting that can happen. And so these are, I think, quite human um, responses. And so as artists, we go, okay, how do we put a mirror up you know, in front of our faces and, you know, our folks' faces and deal with this thing, you know, um, and talk about it. Thank you. Um, there's another question here from Isaiah. As now there are also young Filipinx uh, Americans entering the nursing profession. In what ways do you see the futurity of nursing evolving as a result of this art and the stories being shared? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know that, um, you know, I think that, you know, Alleluia inviting me on to kind of participate in this conversation kind of makes me think about, you know, where the figure or, or the community of nurses was in my imagination in terms of an audience, right? Uh, because I think I was thinking very intimately and limitedly that I was writing this to my family, and that's it, right? Um, and so I think people gravitated that to that for certain for different reasons. Um, but it, you know, as I think about it, you know, in, um, yeah, this third, third generation, fourth generation philams are becoming nurses, right? And it's you know, students are still nursing students that come across, you know, these Asian American and ethnic studies and uh, Filipino American studies classes, and and I think that. You know this sort of I guess the you know the art or and the stories that 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 I think all of us are trying to to um, engage with are you know uh, hopefully produce a, a set of questions that that help them kind of understand the long, longer tradition of you know the labor right the labor part but also you know these other um, I think you know the the uh, the stuff that doesn't get um, read within these dominant paradigms of care, right? I think is, is the way that I'm interpret, interpreting a little bit of what you're saying, Jennifer. Um, just, the, you know, the, the, the life forms and the, the practices and, you know, the daily, you know, um, the daily lives, right? The outside of being a medium for someone else's wellness, right? And so I think, you know, there are, there, we had a great panelist uh, Dr. Claire Valderrama Wallace, who's a nursing professor at Cal State East Bay, um, and she's an organizer and, and is really interested in, in looking at um, very materially and explicitly decolonization and abolition and as a way to inform nursing practice, right? And so I think that there's these really vibrant political ideas that are coming to the surface that are going to affect all of the ways, all of us who are within different labor sectors. And I think that that's really promising and exciting to think about, again, to use your word earlier, Joyce, to, to think about those, well, I, and also the Isaiah's, um, uh, the, the, what the uh, uh, alternative futures look like, right? And, and how we practice care, what the role of the nurse, what the artist is, and what that collaboration looks like. And, and, and I think that, you know, um, uh, those collaborations are ready for us to take up. You know, I think interdisciplinarity has offered that as a framework, uh, and, and um, it's just that we're not always we don't have the time or capacity because of what discipline does to us, right? And saying we need to work in this particular way for our freedom, for our care. 
you know, what's what's stopping us from actually collaborating and, and, and finding out um, uh, how to practice that alternative future now, right before, uh, instead of waiting for it. You know? One of the things about USF is that, you know, it's a school with a very, very uh, large uh, nursing uh, majors population, many of whom are Filipinos. Uh, or Filipino American, and they're often in my Filipino American arts class, or they're sometimes they're just in my general studio classes. Um, but I always make a point of sharing the nurse work, specifically the floor project, and uh, some of the work was actually exhibited at USF. And it's really interesting watching them kind of come into this relationship that they actually have a personal narrative that is valid that they're constructing in their moment as young people, um, and that there's. There's so many layers to who they are and who they're going to be. And, and the, yes, they're definitely in the inheritors of some family expectation as to what their narrative is supposed to look like um, as nurses in America. Um, and so it's really kind of beautiful to have these conversations with them as they navigate this, um, uh, as they just begin their journey as nurses. I'm thinking very specifically of one student I had in my comics class, just randomly, but young Filipino American woman uh, who was in my comics class just as COVID hit, and the comics she turned out as a as, as a burgeoning nurse about health and about nursing and about <laughs> about Zoom were just so profound. Um, so shout out to Denise Santos if you're out there. Um, they just really moved me tremendously, and I just love that she was owning her narrative and making it part of her creative work. Um, we should probably wrap up soon but before we do i just ask alleluia one last time if there's any you know wishes that you want to express into this space for for the nursing the wounds project or um support you want to call for um we have a few uh activities that um that we're planning and hopefully that uh folks can visit a website or get on our newsletter to hear about that um we're hoping to kind of open a space for nurses to actually talk story. And that's what we heard from our last um, um, webinar. Oops, sorry. Oh my gosh. Are you guys there? Yeah, we can still hear you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know what happened. Um, so yeah, um, to, to um, you know, keep abreast with the things that we are doing and um, really interested in more stories from different people. So um, thank you for joining us. Go ahead, Joyce. So um, I just wanna thank all the panelists for joining us today. I'm so grateful for you um, being here in this panel and in the world and doing your work. And um, yeah, keep, keep it going. <laughs> and rest and also rest. I hope you also get rest. Um, and thank you to the audience for joining us. And I'll turn it back over to Alleluia. Yes, again, um, thank you for joining us um, this evening. Um, again, the event was brought to you by Cool Arts and my big salamat to Joyce, Jennifer, and Jason and the following community organizations, Filipino American Development Foundation, Yerba Buena Arts and Events, Belosan Center of Filipino Studies at UC Davis. And this project again is funded by Hewlett Foundation and San Francisco Arts Commission. I would like to invite you, if you are in San Francisco this coming weekend, to Lakbay Diwa Cultural Ceremony, Saturday and Sunday, May 1st and 2nd, at the Arabuena Gardens in San Francisco. And for more information and details, please visit our website, www.coolarts-sf.org. Thank you and good night.